thank you. Things. Okay. So All right. Good. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. <laughs> good morning. Welcome, everybody. I am so excited to welcome you all to um, this curriculum and instruction colloquium. I am Nicole Louie, um, here as the co-chair of the colloquium committee. This is also the first Tom and Sally Carpenter lecture, and we are, are graced by the presence of Sally Carpenter. If you would just give a wave. Thank you so much for supporting uh, the math education area and sponsoring this lecture. We also have um, teachers here, students, um, and faculty from, it looks like from EdPsych and CNI, um, and maybe some other areas as well, but welcome everybody. We're really happy that you're able to join us. I'm sorry, I messed something up. My kids send me a lot of text messages <laughs> and I was really afraid I was gonna get one during the talk. So I had to put on do not disturb. And I can't see which I have PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, my apologies, everyone. Um, so this is Beth Bennett. We are super excited to have her here today for this talk. Beth is a professor at the University of California, Irvine, where she also directs um, teacher education and co-founded the Teaching Academy. She has, of course, won lots of awards for her teaching and her research. Um, and her work is especially uh, well-known on teacher noticing, on bringing attention to this, this area of, um, this important area of teachers' work and how we understand what teachers pay attention to and how they can be supported to pay attention um, and respond uh, in ways that really support ambitious and equitable mathematics instruction. It's been super influential in my own career. And um, yeah, so uh, I also thought it was really fitting. So. Beth was chosen by student nomination. I thought it was really fitting that she's the first person that we're bringing for the Tom and Sally Carpenter lecture because her work is so nicely aligned with um, the ways that Tom Carpenter and colleagues and students um, brought such attention to the details of students' mathematical thinking and reasoning, and also the ways that teachers were brought into that work um, as partners and not just as research subjects. And I think that's really nicely represented in Beth's work as well. So please join me in welcoming her for this talk. Thank you. I'm gonna ask you to help me with one thing. Yes. Getting this back in presenter mode. Oh, I can't okay. My, maybe I'm moving that way. Our presenter view here. Yeah, I'm just- Oh, the mouse is lost. Mouse, yeah. I see it over there and I see it coming. I see it in the middle of the screen. Uh-huh. Oh, here yep. it is. Okay, there, there, there it is. Go. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Thank Yay. you. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to sort of stay close to here because my notes are up here and I still haven't sort of gotten this talk down that I can say it off the cuff. So um, I first want to say thank you so much for inviting me to be here in person. Um, we were talking a few moments ago how nice it is to be back in person and giving these kinds of talks. There's just something irreplaceable um, about being in the same space as people. Um, I also want to say um, thank you for inviting me to give this Tom and Sally Carpenter invited talk. Um, I met Tom as a young graduate student. And um, some of you know that I'm a former high school English and communication teacher and wonder how does this person do research in math education? And um, it's largely because I found it very curious when I started graduate school that in English language arts, we talk so much. Um, we talk about our thinking, we talk about our ideas. And at the time, that was a novel idea in mathematics education. And it continues to be a novel idea, um, unfortunately, in schooling. And so it makes me wonder, what are the kinds of practices that teachers need to engage in? Um, so Tom's work was very influential in helping us think about what it means to create discourse-rich classroom spaces. And also um, his work was so influential in really centering the study of teaching and teaching and learning as an area of inquiry, um, which is what I entered graduate school very concerned about. Um, so as Nicole mentioned, um, I came to the work of teacher noticing because I was very interested in this knowledge base for teachers to think about um, centering student thinking and over time. And, and then of course in graduate school, I came to realize it's not just a knowledge base, but practices that are situated inside of broader systems. Um, and over time, a lot of my work has 
has shifted to not only think about, I still think about the work on student thinking, um, but also to think about uh, uh, how teachers notice and are aware of and attentive to, to, attentive to students from an equity lens um, in order to be thinking about how to support equity and justice in classroom contexts. So the title of today's talk is Designing to Disrupt, Developing Pre-Service Teachers' Inner Witness for Equity and Justice. And before I get started, I want to acknowledge the Ho-Chunk Nation, who are traditional custodians of this land, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. So I like to start off by sharing the work um, that I do. My apologies, thank you. Okay, um, so the reason I do this work is most uh, largely because I'm very committed to advancing the fields and the public's understanding of the complex work of teaching. Um, I often think that teachers are positioned as the problem. Um, we hear these narratives often in, in social settings where teachers are sort of not doing a good enough job. And I think we need to disrupt that narrative. That's the narrative I'm aiming to disrupt in my work. And I try to do that by trying to unveil the complexity of teachers' knowledge, practice, and how they are situated inside of educational systems. Um, my goal is to support the life trajectories of teachers as learners, to also elevate the voices of teachers as agents of change. Through many of our policies, we've, we've removed the agency that teachers have in doing their work. And so I wanna try to think about how we can give them more agency um, in, in their profession to pro keep, to re-professionalize teaching. And also I see that as a way to improve students' agency and opportunity. So I think that's important to understand sort of why I'm doing the work that I do. Um, before jumping into the talk, I want to acknowledge the large group of people who have been supporting um, and collaborating with me on this work. Um, you can see one person looks familiar up there, Priyanka, uh, who's a fantastic graduate student researcher at the time, now an, an assistant professor here. Um, I could say something about each and every one of these people. Um, the whole talk can be about all of their contributions. Um, but anything that I'm talking about today is a representation of the collective thinking of this group. I also want to point out that um, many of these people stretched my thinking and disrupted my own thinking about teachers teaching, mathematics teaching, and also really helping me understand, and I'm always in the process of understanding um, how um, educational systems perpetuate inequities, and, and especially the purpose of doing that in U.S. system of schooling. Um, so I, I just want to acknowledge them, each of them, for opening my eyes to the problematic nature of um, our system of schooling in the U.S. and, um, and to also um, recognize that they've helped me try to be attentive to my own blind spots, though much of it will always be invisible to me because of my positionality and histories. So today I want to talk about teacher noticing, particularly as it relates to equitable math teaching. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the field has been theorizing teacher noticing for equitable math teaching. You'll hear me draw on Nicole's work quite extensively. Um, I'll share a little bit about the co-attend research project. Then we'll go into one little piece of that, which has been developing pre-service teachers awareness of their noticing and really thinking about their learning to notice for equity. And then I'll talk a little bit about discussion and next steps. So what is noticing? So I wanna begin by, begin by exploring the construct of noticing. And I thought we'd start by looking at a picture that is somewhat familiar to us. Um, so just take a look at that. And I'd like to invite some folks to share some things that they notice, some things that are standing out to them. Looks warm. <laughs> okay, this is a summer scene in Madison in about August. Yeah, looking at the phone. That's never learned how to walk in my heels. Ah, ah I'm just saying, okay, heels. Uh huh. I know there's the cute heels. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are there other objects of noticing? Two women, or two men, and only women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Anything person else? with a larger tote bag looking at the person with the tote bag. Okay. Yeah. So I like to start this because there's, it seems like a pretty mundane activity, people walking across the street. 
And I don't know about the rest of you, but I spent a lot of time sitting in Zoom. And as a result, I had to start visiting some physical therapists because my body was achy a little bit. That might also be that I turned to the other side of a certain age that we don't like to mention all too often. But um, as I as as I was sitting, you know, realizing that my body was hurting, I started going to physical therapists, and then we would talk about what we do. And um, I was always aware that they would take a few minutes at the beginning of a session to sort of size up my body. They would ask me to stand still. They'd look at my shoulders. They'd look at my hips. And then we'd start talking about what they do. And I would, I would ask them, what are you paying attention to? What are you looking for? I would tell them what I do. So we talked about this scene. I showed them this picture and I, I asked them, what are the kinds of things that you notice? And they uh, they noticed many of the kinds of things that you shared. They noticed the kinds of shoes that people are wearing, people typing on their phones, how high or low the curb is. Um, they noticed people carrying backpacks, their shoulder bags if they're carrying, you know, how heavy the items might be or how light the bags appear to be. Um, they also were talking to me about how they do notice when people are walking. I told them they're, they must have these like like little radars when they're walking in the world that just seeing people's shoulders all wonky, they actually notice people's hips. And as we continued talking, they were telling me that my hamstring in injury was actually probably a problem with my ankle on the other side and, or my shoulders. And so we realized that through knowledge and experience, they've developed what we call um, these sort of heightened sensitivity um, based on this knowledge and experience, and that Goodwin refers to this as a professional vision, right? Through training and experience, they learn how to look at and make sense of the body, um, and they have sort of ways of characterizing that. So when I started this work with Miriam Sharon about 25 years ago, we started thinking about what is teacher's professional vision, and that turned us to think about what teachers notice. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So in, in, the, in our work, we thought a lot about teachers also learn how to look at and make sense of teaching um, through their training and experience. Now, more recently, um, Nicole's work especially has really pushed the field, Lonnie Horn's work also, to help us recognize that um, it's not only through training and experience. I actually think what's unique about teaching is that teachers spend so many years sitting in classrooms, listening to all the narratives that operate in schooling as students, um, but also then through training, they're embedded in these different kinds of contexts where they're picking up these narratives to make sense of teaching and learning, no matter how hard we try in our pre-service courses and in our um, teacher preparation programs to provide them with tools and frameworks. These narratives are all around them as well. And so they're grappling with how to make sense of teaching and learning. Um, and so, so the point of that is that these categorical systems are not only ones that we provide to them, which are also socially and politically constructed, but also um, through the social and political discourses of schooling generally. Um, so in my work, I've been thinking a, a lot about teacher noticing and I, and the way I think about it is teachers' attention and interpretation that supports the actions that we see in classrooms. I know that Vicki Jacobs and colleagues um, add responding, although they actually add deciding to respond. Um, so the response itself is not necessarily part of their noticing framework. But in my work, I think about it as teachers' attention and sense-making that supports the actions that we observe. Um, and so again, just like the physical therapist, teachers notice lots of different things. I show them videos and I could show them a video for about 30 seconds in a classroom They'll notice how students are feeling. They'll notice um, which students are getting along, how students communicate with each other, the contributions that they make. They'll notice them both an individual contribution, the contribution of a group, the whole class. They're always thinking about, um, about what they're looking at at different grain sizes and time scales, which I think is super interesting. They notice students' sense of belonging, access they have to resources. Some teachers notice if there's carpet on the floor. Now, because that's become more standard in classrooms, that might become something they tend to disregard now. But when that was not a common feature of a classroom, they would notice that because that would reveal something to them, either about the affluence of the school, what kinds of resources the school has available to them to have whiteboards. When they, we changed to whiteboards, now we have technology. So they're noticing all sorts of kinds of things. 
So we think about that in terms of the multidimensionality of teacher noticing. Um, now Priyanka uh, worked with me on a paper where we sort of unpack teachers' multidimensionality for uh, noticing for equity. I'd love to talk with some of you about that later. One of the things that we came to realize through much of that work is that teachers' noticing is also subjective and selective. So it's not just that they can sort of um, that they're that they're uh, agnostic to what kinds of things that they're noticing. They're making some choices about that as well. Um, they're also making some choices to disregard some features in the classroom. And this uh, likely looks familiar to you. So one of the things that Nicole has really brought to the research on noticing that I think is really significant and important and has shaped um, some of the work that we're doing now on our analysis is to think about the linking of framing to teachers' attention and sense-making of classroom interactions. And what I think is really important about this, and I had to read that paper a few times as I to, to really understand this, um, is that um, teachers' attention and sense-making is inextricably linked to the broader discourses and context and sociopolitical context of schooling. So what teachers are attending to, how they're making sense of it, we cannot separate it from these broader um, discourses that are happening in mathematics education. So in our work then, oh, let me add one other piece. Finally, the other piece that we're drawing on in this work is work by John Mason and Alexis Patterson-Williams and the co her colleagues at UC Davis, who proposed that teachers noticing um, is also about developing an awareness of the self as a noticer. And as Williams and colleagues write, the inner witness is akin to a magnifying glass that highlights information and interactions according to the lens or perspective the teacher has developed. It can be likened to a guide on your shoulder pointing out relevant information. And they propose that it becomes imperative for teachers to develop an inner witness or the intentional self-observation necessary to sustain disciplined attempts to notice issues of justice in teaching. Um, so we bring these three lines of work together, the multidimensionality of teachers noticing, noticing as being culturally shaped, and this idea that teachers need to develop an inner witness to be monitoring their noticing and awareness at any given time to be advancing equity and justice in their teaching. I also want to think just briefly about why this is important in the context of math education in particular. Um, Research continuously reports differential levels of achievement in mathematics for low income and racial, cultural, linguistic, and neurodiverse groups of students, suggesting that these groups of students do not have the same access and opportunities as more dominant groups. And I draw on my colleague, Andy Brantlinger's research, who really helps us recognize there's a lot of critique of the achievement narrative, which I appreciate. And at the same time, he recognizes that if we don't center um, and think carefully about achievement, we're also doing a disservice to minority groups. So we have to sort of, because we wanna give them access and opportunity to engage in the system, to change the system. So, so I, I'm always trying to balance um, how much we want to attend to the achievement narrative while also trying to be critical of that narrative at the same time. Um, research is also shows that the cultural, linguistic, and racial minority groups have inequ inequitable access and opportunities to enroll in higher level courses. And the research on teacher noticing bears this finding out as well. Krista Jackson and colleagues, their work has found that teachers notice girls and students of color differently in the mathematics classroom, which disadvantages them relative to their white male peers. If you're not familiar with her work, I recommend reading it. It's, she's done some really great more traditional looking um, educational psychology like studies and their fi her findings are very um, important to the field of noticing. And a collection of more recent research identifies that teachers who create equitable classrooms are more aware of and respond to not only the intellectual aspects of classrooms, what many of us think about as the student thinking portion, but are also aware of the relational, cultural, and linguistic aspects of classrooms and how they impact students' learning trajectories. So together, this research has raised questions that Erickson um, posed in a different version to the field and one that I'm taking up now which is how do teachers learn to notice to support students learning from a range to support the learning of students from a range of social, cultural, 
ethnic, racial, gender, and linguistic backgrounds to engage meaningful in mathematics, meaningfully in mathematics classrooms. Okay, so in his, when he first started this work, he was sort of wondering, what's the nature of teachers noticing who are doing that work? What we've been doing at UCI is trying to think about how do we support teachers learning to notice in order to disrupt these patterns? That switch just means analytically we're doing a little bit different kinds of things, um, but drawing off this very important work of, of many in the field who I just cited. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the COATED project. Um, COATED stands for Community and Teacher Teams Investigate Equitable Noticing and Dispositions. Vicki Hand and I, um, we had a, a small Spencer grant where we worked with um, teams of teachers to, to investigate the nature of their noticing for equity. And at the end of that study, we brought them together in almost like a video club format. And we just sat around the table and they watched video from each other's classrooms. And they said, wow, this is so cool to talk to each other about each other's teaching. Um, for many of us who have been using video for quite some time, we think the notion of deprivatizing teaching through video analysis is commonplace, just as we often think that elevating student thinking in a mathematics classroom is commonplace. Neither of those things are commonplace. Teachers still very much appreciate the opportunities um, to get insight into each other's classrooms. So when they were looking at video of each other's classrooms and they were so excited um, to hear each other's thinking that was driving that. Vicki and I thought, you know, we thought, how can we write another grant and work with these teachers, if that's of interest to them, to um, give them more opportunities to do this together? Um, but we also made an important turn, and I credit Vicki um, and many of the colleagues at um, CU Boulder um, and others who thought about um, we don't only want to privilege the voice of teachers but also bringing in community youth educators who are from the communities of youth and who have can bring the perspectives that youth um, experience in schooling um, to also disrupt some of teachers noticing. I want to emphasize that for me, remember I shared my commitments about centering teachers as agents of change. So that was a, a tension that I experienced on this project because in many ways we were elevating community educators perspective. And I felt like there were times where I was um, almost having to set on a shelf something that was a core principle for me. And we wrestled with that quite a bit on the project. And over time, I would say no surprise at UC Irvine, we will see that the teacher's perspectives became more central. I was telling Nicole, if I could do this project again, I would now find a way to bring in the community educator's perspective because I do think that they bring a perspective that was really essential. At the same time, I do wanna recognize at UC Irvine, several of our teachers are also people who have chosen to teach in the particular schools where they're teaching because they grew up in those communities, they live in those communities. So in some ways they are the community educators. So that's something we're trying to disentangle in our data is what that means and how we can understand that. Um, so the idea was that if we could bring these teams together, university researchers who also serve as teacher educators, mathematics teachers, and activists from students' communities, how could that serve to disrupt uh, mathematics education as a white institutional space so that racial, social, linguistic, gender, and neurodiverse students can take up space in and beyond the mathematics classroom? COATEN took on many phases over the years. We started the project, um, and I'm just going to sort of go through some, some highlights of the project. In the first year, 2018, um, fall of 2017, we did the recruitment. Then in spring of 2018 and in summer, we um, worked with some teachers conducting observations, conducting what we called noticing interviews, where we videotaped and then asked them to share with us the kinds of things that they were noticing in the moment. We then did a summer um, workshop where we met together to develop shared understandings of what we think about, what is equity, what is um, what is equity in mathematics education, um, because for the community educators, maybe that was what the mathematics education was less central to them. Um, and then also thinking about um, how we might uh, support teachers and learning to notice for equity. We were really trying to develop a shared language and shared frameworks. Then in the fall, we were back inside of teachers' classrooms and we met monthly and we were bringing data from teachers' classrooms. The idea being that at the end of that year of data collection or that experience, we would co-write and co-develop conference proposals. 
Um, so in the summer of 2019, we were uh, we were we had great ideas to write some proposals for AERA, NCTM, California Math Council, and the group at UCI they were just not interested. They did not, they really had no interest in doing conference presentations. That's something of the academy. But they were very firm that other teachers need to learn and experience what they experience. So we, they really wanted to design professional development. And they kept saying over and over again, pre-service teachers need to engage in this work. And many of them are mentor teachers, mentor classroom teachers. And they mentioned over and over, pre-service teachers need to do this work. So you can imagine, we started doing co-design work, 2020 comes, so we had to sort of pause our plans. I teach a class at UC Irvine um, for our secondary, all of our teacher candidates, not just the math candidates. Um, and that's a whole other discussion we can have. Um, but I draw a lot on the work from math education in that course. Um, and I adapted a pre this pre-service course I teach called Learning to Learn from Teaching so that we could really center it on the concepts that this group um, identified as being essential to the professional development. So they were sort of co-designers. Um, they were running an online professional development community while I was teaching the class, but they were visiting my class and um, we were showing video from their teaching in the course as well. Much of it mirroring what we were doing for the professional development. These were the core concepts that in that summer they identified as needing to be essential for the professional development. Um, the idea was um, what, what these teachers talked about was the, the ne necessity of developing a, awareness of yourself as a noticer, as a way of being and doing as a teacher. Um, they recognized it's a very meta kind of way of thinking about yourself as a teacher, but they also talked about, you know, they, they use that analogy of like having someone tapping on their shoulder and sort of saying, pay attention to this right now, that they experience teaching that way, that while they're teaching, it's almost as if there's this sort of meta thing saying to them, don't forget to look over here. Don't forget to pay attention to this. Don't forget to check in with this student. Um, and they wanted, they kept emphasizing home that that was sort of an overarching goal because that coupled with thinking about your philosophy of practice is going to drive your attention to yourself as, be, as being a historical being, the systemic histories and inequities in school, attending to positioning and identities as they play out in classroom interactions, and also thinking about how you can organize your classroom space to notice in order to disrupt. Um, so those became the sort of core constructs that I revised this course, Learning to Learn from Teaching, around, um, along with centering the work on attending to students' thinking and the role of classroom discourse in that process. Uh, I'd like to highlight all of the research that the team has been involved with on this project, and we're going to zoom in on this corner here, specific, specifically in thinking about how teacher education um, to use the words from the teachers in our progress in, in our project can make the invisible visible in order to develop awareness of yourselves as noticers. Okay, so now we're going to turn to the research study um, that's the focus of today's talk. Um, I want to provide some details about the course. Um, it's a it's a ten week course, not much time, in a fourteen month post baccalaureate pre service uh, a teacher education program. Um, I know that uh, I, 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 my memory serves Wisconsin. You all have them as undergraduates. You probably have a master's program as well. Um, in California, you cannot get your teaching credential as an undergraduate student, except for two special programs, one at UCI and one at Berkeley. Um, but outside of that, everywhere in California, it's a post -bac program. And many of these programs are nine months. Um, we, ours is a 14-month master's program. So we pack it in, in those 14 months. Um, and I teach a class in the fall quarter. The candidates have been, we have two five-week summer quarters that they take classes. Then they're in my class in fall. It's a, and, and that's when, when I get to see them. It's right when they're beginning to do their observations of teaching. So we started, we start the class with really thinking about what are their ideas about knowing and learning. Um, I draw off of the work of Leslie Herencall and colleagues who think about 
learning as don't knowing, doing, and being. I think that's a nice framework for pre-service teachers to move away from knowing as just knowledge acquisition to noticing as also engaging in practices and developing identities. Um, so that's sort of a new construct for them. We think about learning as a sense-making activity, and I draw a lot on the research in math education to help them do that, and in science education. We think about what it means to engage in inquiry into student thinking during teaching, um, why you need to attend carefully to the ideas that students bring, um, and toward what aim, not to get to an answer, but to treat their ideas with dignity and humanity and to also use them as levers uh, for learning. We shift to then thinking about how discourse-rich classroom environments can elevate and bring to the fore student thinking. And then we also think about how students become positioned in classroom, um, in discourse-rich classrooms and how teachers need to be attending simultaneously to positioning and the opportunities um, that students have to develop identities as mathematics learners through that process. And then think about both our personal and social histories and how they shape the kinds of things that we attend to. Um, and then at the end of the course, we sort of take a rehumanizing framework drawing off of the work of Rochelle Gutierrez um, so that we can think about teaching and learning for um, pushing us for uh, thinking about teaching and learning for a goal of joy and social transformation, um, not only to serve our sort of capitalist notions of um, schooling. So that's a lot in 10 weeks, as you all can imagine. Um, but you know, I was so inspired by these teachers and collaborators who said, we need to do this with free service teachers. Um, you can also imagine that, um, uh, uh, let me just tell you real quickly, we have um, a bunch of artifacts that we use in the class. We use video from our practicing teachers. We uh, uh, draw on some video resources. Um, from uh, other sources that are that are published uh, out in the world. Um, we have them create artifacts and we also um, pull from different um, research articles. There's a paper by Thomas Phillip um, where he uh, outlines a transcript where students are looking at data and I'm gonna talk about that more in more detail. Um, we look carefully at that transcript to think about how students are positioned. We also listen to podcasts. Um, and um, lots of news sources to think about social histories and how those are playing out now. Um, and all of this very timely because these are issues that are being made visible, um, especially in 2020, 2021, and in current day, though many of us are not surprised that some of these conversations begin to fade over time. Um, but we really try to elevate and, and help students recognize um, how their classroom noticing is shaped by broader discussions um, in, in, uh, in the world. Okay, so because our candidates were not in the field in fall of 2020, I had to revise the final assignment that they were doing. And what we did is each week that we were, you know, looking at these artifacts and talking about them and using these frameworks, we, we had them keep a noticing journal. And so uh, the graduate student, Ethan Rubin and I, had, who was the TA for the class and also the co-author on the paper I'm sharing today. Um, he and I had this great idea. Um, uh, Priyanka was one of the folks who helped us come up with this idea of creating a system of noticing as an analytic tool. And we thought, well, let's have pre-service teachers develop their personal system of noticing. So they essentially traced through their noticing journal and they got a quick um, intro to qualitative methods and they were tracing the goal was to get them to trace who they were as noticers by looking back at their noticing journal entries. And then they wrote a paper using the frameworks. And the idea was to say, you know, we thought in a very simplified form, we thought they might say, oh, early on in the class, I was not paying attention to these kinds of things. Now I know that these kinds of things are important to pay attention to. I'm giving you the very simplified version. That's somewhat what these essays looked like over time, okay? So we asked them to write an essay explaining how they arrived at their system of noticing map. And we thought of this as an opportunity to re-narrate and re-envision what responsive and equitable teaching could look like. Because we wouldn't expect them in the fall to necessarily have these lenses. But over time, we were hoping that they would say, oh, wait a second, now that I think back to that, 
I think I might want to look at it from this lens. And if I were to look at it from this lens, it's going to help me see it differently in these kinds of ways. So I would welcome an opportunity to talk with folks about our pedagogies of teacher ed, the kinds of artifacts I think we need to make more visible to each other, the kinds of work that we ask our candidates to produce. Um, Alexis Patterson Williams and I are hoping to engage in some of that work together. But if folks here are interested in that, I'd welcome an opportunity to have conversations with you. Okay, so the two questions we took to this study are, what frameworks for responsive and equitable teaching do pre-service teachers adopt to narrate their noticing? And how do they take up these frameworks and use them to frame their noticing? And we use these as a way to infer how they, um, what their inner witness is and is becoming for noticing for equity. The data came from five of our secondary mathematics teacher candidates. I wanna say this is very exploratory. Um, five of the 11 gave us uh, permission to look at their data. And these are the five students. Um, these are pseudonyms. And we had three females, two males. Juan and Alice identified as Latino. Katie identified as Filipino. Talia identified as Vietnamese. And Yusuf identified as white. Um, the analysis was an iterative process that took place in three phases. In the first phase, Ethan and I each read through and wrote memos about the objects of teachers' attention, and we noted whether frameworks from the course were being used and what that might reveal about whether and how um, these dominant discourses were shaping their noticing, what, what kinds of things were they paying attention to, and um, what did that reveal about the discourses that they were sort of identifying and understanding. Um, uh, so for example, some candidates would use language about whether students' responses were correct or incorrect, and then we would infer from that a dominant narrative of mathematical accuracy and achievement, even though they might not use that language. Um, and then also we were looking to see, you know, were, were they just flagging instances using the language from the frameworks that the course provided? Uh, in the second phase, Ethan engaged in more focus coding around three areas. He was looking at how terms were used. Um, were they using problematizing statements, um, norms and value statements, whether something was good or bad or should be, should be different. Um, and we also considered the specificity and consistency of statements throughout their essays, using as, this as an indication of becoming aware of how particular lenses were shaping their noticing. And then we created profiles for each candidates in which we inferred narratives that were framing their noticing. And then in phase three, we conducted a cross-case analysis to identify patterns in their frames, highlighting aspects of noticing that candidates became aware of needing to expand, disrupt, or hone, while also looking for the persistence of dominant narratives that shape their noticing. So now we'll take a look at the results. So the first main finding is that all five of the pre-service teachers applied terms and constructs from the course to narrate their noticing. But what was interesting to us is that there was variation in how they applied those constructs. So we'll take a look at the example of student-centered discourse. We talked a lot about discourse and they, they emphasized um, the importance of a discourse-rich classroom environment. But in doing so, they did that very differently. So two teachers, Yusuf and Juan, framed their attention to discourse from a lens of achievement. That is, they sh they, that they thought about students sharing their thinking in order to advance the mathematical achievement that could happen in the classroom. So Yusuf would, wrote, um, the way students talk and behave as they're working on mathematics to notice for required mathematical skills and competencies. He was looking for their talk as an indication of whether they were achieving the math. Um, and, uh, let me go to the next example. Sorry, I want to make sure I get the teachers right here. Okay, another frame related to motivation and interest. Another sort of dominant narrative that we hear in the world about people being motivated to want to learn. So Talia, she wrote, I wanted to see if they were enjoying themselves in the class. The more that students are having fun in the classroom, the more they will come to like the teacher and the lessons that are being taught and then become more curious of the topics. This actually reminds me of some of Tom's work from many years ago, um, talking about needing to move teachers away from sort of this idea of doing a lesson because it's fun and interesting, 
but to really think about the math the core mathematical ideas and how students can make progress on those ideas. And then finally, two other teachers frame their noticing of student-centered discourse in terms of identity and agency. And Alice's excerpt reflects this perspective. She wrote, students develop their identity through interactions. Thus, participation is key in providing students with an opportunity to develop their identity. Through communication, students can share their tools and culture with other students. So we can see that they were all attending broadly to classroom discourse and student discourse, but very different frames were shaping the way that they were thinking about that in their noticing. Our second finding is that the candidates re-envision from an aspirational frame. And what was interesting to us is that their, comment, their comments focused on what they would like to see happen in the classroom, but that was often um, written in a way that they positioned it relative to what was a problem in the classroom. So Ethan was noticing in the data that they were problematizing teaching and learning. And so that coding, um, where we're looking at the ways that they were, the kinds of language that they were using, this helped us notice these contrasts that they were making. So let me give you um, an example of that. Uh, Yusuf and Katie here, they both problematized the role of the teacher as being the only authority in the classroom and the need to shift greater authority to the students. So Yusuf writes here, the teacher's the only authority, that's the problem. And the aspiration is to create a student-centered classroom that creates an equal opportunity for all and make the subject relatable. And Katie says, the teachers need to learn how to really listen to their students, that's the problem. And students should lead the direction of the discussion. That's what they, they were seeing could be where they could move to based on that problem. Looking at the problems helped us see these dominant narratives that were driving the kinds of ways that they frame instruction. And the other two teachers, Alice and Juan, recognize problems with how students and their ideas are positioned in the classroom. With Alice noticing that mathematics privileges being fast and accurate and, and using that as an indicator of smartness, and Juan noting that teachers focus on what students do wrong. They focus too much on what students are doing wrong. He wants to look at positive interactions and ideas. So this finding suggests to us that pre-service teachers' emerging vision of responsive and equitable math instruction served as a tool to help them name existing problematic practices that are rooted in dominant narratives, what may not have been on their radar previously, and to also identify practices that could potentially disrupt existing problematic practices in order to develop more student-centered classrooms. So our third finding is that the candidates re-narrated their noticing through dominant narratives. And I wanna take a look at this example that I alluded to um, earlier. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about it. So we, um, in one of the lessons, in one of the class sessions, the pre-service teachers were asked to, um, to uh, look at, to think about their personal histories and their positionality, and to think about how teachers' personal histories and positionality shapes the kinds of things they can see and notice, but also that they don't see, that they're often unable to see. So we took an example from Thomas Phillips' article where the um, in the in this example, the the class was looking at Netflix data, uh, viewing patterns for different films. And one of the films featured, it was a blockbuster film that featured highly um, famous white actors, uh, Brad Pitt and Kate Blanchett. And another was a film that featured well-known black actors. Um, one of them was Tyler pa Tyler Perry. But the movie industry doesn't often elevate and advertise um, these individuals in the same way that they do these white actors. Ironically, living in Los Angeles, this becomes even more visible to me when you're driving on the 405 and you see all these um, billboards, who's featured and who's not. Um, and this um, this lesson came from um, a the, the interaction came from a classroom that is um, from a school in the greater Los Angeles area. Um, 
And we selected the segment because um, the teacher is a white teacher, a white male teacher. And in it, um, there's one black student, William, who uses his knowledge of the kinds of movies that would be of interest to the black community to make sense of the data. It's very, very interesting. He closely examines the different graphs from different cities, and he's doing this very rich sense-making um, and really thinking about which graphs make sense um, in terms of who, who he knows populates different cities, his understanding of Atlanta having a large black population and in different kinds of cities looking at these patterns. And um, we also examine different aspects of the social interaction and how they tie to student positioning in this transcript. Um, there's students bantering back and forth and the talk becomes racialized through their interactions. The teacher does not address this banter, nor does he take up William's ideas and interpretations around the graphs. Um, the, interest, the interaction becomes progressively more harmful for William, who at the end of the interaction, he shuts down. And it's noteworthy to me because, well, for many reasons, this clip is noteworthy, but I think it's extremely noteworthy because here's a student who's doing very rich mathematical sense making. And those ideas are not being attended to nor is the sort of interaction between the students being attended to. Um, and so I'm trying to, in, in using this with the pre-service teachers, trying to help them think about the positionality of the teacher and why those kinds of things might be invisible to that teacher. Um, and again, keeping in mind my commitment to teachers, I'm not trying to criticize that teacher as a human being, but to situate them in a broader history of our schooling and in a broader history of the aims of education that this teacher has been apprenticed into and that we want to problematize ourselves so that we can always be working toward expanding our own noticing. Okay, so I wanna be really clear. I try to balance that very carefully when I'm working um, with teachers in pre-service and um, in service. So what we found here is that the pre-service teachers re-narrated their initial noticing of their interaction in this essay, and they framed these in ways that upheld and reinforced color blind and color evasive lenses. So for example, Juan wrote, we ostracize an individual due to simply the color of their skin, but we are all humans, so why do these discrepancies exist? And Katie's response also evaded talk about race when she says, the teacher positioned himself as the authority figure in the room by acting as the gatekeeper of knowledge. And Talia wrote, the student was being disregarded so much and constantly defending his opinion to the point where he just stopped. Now, all three recognized that the interaction was problematic, but none of them talked about the racialized nature of that interaction after we spent a good amount of time thinking through what might be problematic about this vis-a-vis -vis the data that they were looking at. William is a black boy whose ideas are incredibly meaningful and they're not being taken up and not being attended to carefully by the teacher. Um, and in some of my work, as you know, many of you know, I do this work on noticing student thinking. This is a point for me where I'd like to do some work um, about thinking about how attending to student thinking is a matter of equity. Because in this case, I think that if the teacher had taken seriously what William was saying and how William was interpreting the graphs because of William's rich knowledge base, William's ideas would have become the center of that discussion. And it would have become very important for the, the class to interrogate the ideas that William was raising, thus positioning him as an agent, positioning him as the knower in the classroom. Okay, so what does this tell us? Again, this is exploratory. We only had five candidates here. We've got another round of data that we're gonna be looking at this year. Um, but in general, we saw that the pre-service teachers were aspiring to move away from teacher-centered models of instruction by adopting frameworks of student-centered or student-led discourse. Um, and this reflects a vision of responsive teaching. But it also shows less focus on how students from minoritized groups are experiencing classrooms as racialized, gendered, and the like. Our findings also show the persistence of dominant frames, which points to the complex, nonlinear, and even contradictory character of these processes of development. 
Learning to recognize dominant narratives and disrupt their influence often involves grappling with tensions and contradictions, and many of which are deeply entangled with teachers' identities, past experiences, institutional contexts, and so on. And um, we know that from the literature that it's very difficult to disrupt these narratives and these frames. So these findings are not so surprising. Um, at the same time, it makes me wonder what do we need to do in order to, to, um, to do this work um, so that we can make progress in this way. Um, so one of the two of the teachers who we're working with on the co-attend team, uh, we've been really pressing on what does it mean to um, engage ourselves and others and to provoke tensions that can become points of contradiction? And what does it mean as teacher educators to facilitate those points of tension and contradictions? Um, I want to just pause here for a second to share as a side note, um, last year, we had an instance where one of our white teachers um, in, in viewing a video was watching and, and did experience tension. And she, she really removed herself from engagement with the co-attend, what, what I think with the co-attend team. What I also know is that she's having a lot of conversations with her teacher partners who are part of co-attend. And she's continuously thinking about and for the last six months has been grappling with that instance watching that video. So while she's not with us doing that work, she is with her colleagues, something that we as researchers don't know is happening, right? It's just because we're part of this team, I know that this is happening. It also tells me something about the time scales that we think about in understanding teacher learning and development. This work takes time, it is hard, it's, requiring her to do deep work on who she is as a white woman. And as much as we want to speed that up, it's also, I'm, I'm glad to know she's engaging with her colleagues around these conversations. I'm hopeful she will want to come back and um, maybe someday do a conference presentation with us on that work. Um, and uh, so I also want to emphasize, this is just a one 10 week class that I shared with you today. Um, it would be a lot to expect for teachers to fundamentally transform in the time frame. It does tell me that we need to do much more work programmatically, um, I think, and really think about across our courses, across us as teacher educators in a program, how can we do this work together? How can we build on that work together? Um, and so that means that teacher educators have to come to the table and think about who we are and what lenses we bring to the work and um, challenge our own identities to, to move that work forward. Um, we've been engaging in some of that work at UCI and Ho Sun Kang um, has been doing some really great um, research on that. Okay, so I just wanna point out, I know we're getting close to time. Um, we are bringing this analysis to the practicing teachers who participated. We led a hybrid professional development last year. We're asking questions about whether and how teachers noticing expands, gets disrupted, um, or becomes reinforced through this professional development focused on developing awareness of our noticing. Um, our preliminary analysis reveals some important findings. Teachers do become aware. They talk about becoming aware of their personal and social history shaping their noticing, the power of looking out for the invisible, how dominant narratives shape their noticing, how practices of mathematics can cause harm to particular groups of students. But I will also say it's not all roses. Um, I'm co-writing a piece right now with a teacher, and I noticed that in our conversations, there's very little talk about race. So I gave him Rochelle Gutierrez's framework um, where she talks about access and achievement, identity and power. And I asked him to interpret his data from that framework. And he looked at it and he said, wow, I'm not really talking about power here, am I? And I said, I don't know, what do you think? And he said, no, I'm not. I'm not. And I said, okay, so what does that mean? He said, I don't know, I need to think about it. So again, this speaks to this ongoing work and how we have to think about creating structures and spaces for that ongoing work. Um, so that means I need to turn to other scholars who, who are experts in facilitating those kinds of conversations um, because I don't know exactly how to facilitate those conversations and I need to learn better how to do that. Um, so 
the, you might have heard me say some of the exciting thing is those same teachers who did not want to do presentations and co-writing, they are now wanting to do presentations and co-writing. Um, and so Vicki and I are currently working with our different groups um, to co-write some chapters that are sort of their stories of change and learning um, through this project. And we are hoping to um, have an edited book that will be for teacher educators, practitioners, um, if researchers want to use it, that's great too, but we really want it to be of utility to practitioners and teacher educators. Um, and uh, we are also, um, I'm asking a lot of questions about how we can, you know, what have I learned about this as a generative model um, for collaborative inquiry? What does it mean to design to center community educator perspectives? As I mentioned at UCI, our community educators um, became less central. I think one reason that is, is three of our teachers um, serve in these multiple roles. And so I think they were able to lend this perspective. Um, but I think we did not do a good enough job leveraging at UCI. Um, we have something called the Center for Educational Partnerships, where they do a lot of youth work. And I think we would have been wise to collaborate with some of the folks who do the work, youth work in that context. Their lives sort of would afford more engagement with this project. Um, and I think they, they're they also partners with the school district. So I look back on that and I think that was a lesson learned and, and I wish we can you know go back in time and, and restart that. Um, and so where we are now is um, sort of thinking about theorizing this as a generative model for professional development. I'm thinking a lot about pedagogies for developing an inner witness. Um, I've done some work on teachers facilitation, uh, teacher educators um, facilitation, how we think about clip selection, sort of the activity systems of professional development. I'm sort of taking that lens to some of this data as well. And as I mentioned, we're involved in um, the collaborative writing process. So I want to end there with a big thank you to all of these people, and in particular, these groups of teachers who you can't see, um, but they are just a phenomenal group of people to work with. And um, I feel like I've just had such great privilege to work with them over the last five years and hope to have many more uh, collaborating with them. So thank you all. And I put my email address up there. So please feel free to email me if you have any questions or um, where I mentioned some things that we're trying to work on. If you're interested um, in, in engaging in those conversations, please let me know um, because we're always looking for other people to engage in that work. So I'm happy to take any questions or hear your comments. Yeah, Holly. Thank you very much. So uh, I love to think about learning as doing the meaning and yeah. knowing and I uplift it in my work. Mm -hmm. And I was intrigued by the idea that the research teachers were able to apply the notice uh, use the elements of the framework to notice. Mm -hmm. So and the idea of doing am I correct that they were the doing of notice, right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I didn't give you I mean I could have do a whole talk on sort of how the class is structured and designed. So in class, we do a lot of noticing tasks, I call them, where they're looking at and, um, you know, analyzing different artifacts. And, you know, we'll ask them, what do you notice? And they'll jot down their ideas. And then we talk about those things. And then we ask them, is there anything else you're noticing now? They would jot those things in a noticing journal, we called it. And then they went back and almost did a meta analysis of that. Yeah. So my question is in relation to the doing. Yep. So we, we find often in teacher education that, especially in those sections, mm -hmm. students are really good at using things that we teach in the course yeah. description. And I'm really wondering are there elements of the course where you saw some of their doing as their teach? some of the stuff that they do in their practice that also speaks a little bit to those noticing that they have their ability to, because I feel that's a big disconnect that we have in the right, that often we really do such a good job yeah. reinforcing the theory yeah. and the noticing, but how do we speak to the doing in practice? Yeah, so Holly, you raised actually a really important question. So let me clarify. 
the way that we use that framework is to help them think about students learning in classrooms as knowing, doing, and being. So that when they're looking at an interaction, they, they can think about it as students are learning some math. There's math content. So I'll, you know the division of fractions video. We use that a lot, the Kathy Humphreys division of fractions video. So we'll talk about what's the knowledge there. That's the knowing. And then we talk about the discourse that students are engaging in. And there's those, that's the doing piece that the students are in. They're engaging in discourse practices. And they're also engaging in lots of other practices when you watch that video and we talk about those. There's a lot of things in that video about how students are positioning each other. And so we talk about that is the doing in a classroom. And the being is that I, I think about it as constellation of stars, maybe that's a bad example. But the way I think about it is like, there's a, lots of collections of interactions that people have and each of those interactions formulates to the identity you, you, are, you are and are becoming all at one time. And so when we talk about the division of fractions video as an example, um, there's a student who makes several errors mathematically and the way she's positioned both by a student, but then by the teacher, what does that mean for the identity that student has to become? So that's how we use that in the class, because I want them to think that kids in classrooms, and also if they're not attending to the positioning and the identity, they're missing a whole bunch of stuff that's going on inside a classroom. So if you're only paying attention to the student thinking, then you're missing all this other stuff that is happening. Our candidates are not teaching while they're taking this class. They are just entering, they're sort of observing teaching. But I think you're, if I understand your question correctly, I think we need to then look at that. What does this mean for our teacher candidates to be knowing these kinds of things, then doing in classrooms and the kinds of identities that they are developing as teachers through that process. And I have not worked with our math methods instructor to think about that. I, I know our elementary, Math instructors do do some work on that. Um, I think that's a really important question and one that I would like to work with our methods instructors more um, to, to, to do this work with them more directly. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we have to, the way we've done it is through what we call our inquiry strand, which is where, because it's a master's program, they have to, they come up with a question in winter quarter, then they go out and collect some data. And then in the summer, they analyze that data and write up a little piece. Um, and the two instructors of that strand, I've worked very closely with them. So they know these frameworks and then they try to help them nudge their questions to be around these kinds of questions when they're in the classroom. Um, I will say they're taking lots of other kinds of classes um, and many of them become interested in lots of other things that are playing out in their school setting. So that doesn't always happen. But I think that's a place where we've tried to pursue those kinds of questions. Did that answer you? Okay. Thanks. Yes. I mean, the example that you shared, thank you so much for this. Oh, it's it's fun. Fun. It's great. <laughs> um, in the example that you shared, especially with a student who has all these great ideas, can you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm so struck by, and this happens a lot when we think about teacher ed and video, mm -hmm. is that it, it feels almost kind of boxed in. And I want to hear more from the students. Mm -hmm. And there was some research, I don't know how much it's progressed, but there was some stuff that came out of the teacher ed program at humane interruption spectrum. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where it was almost like a rehearsal where you had to do the renovation and they got the field, you know, practice this pause where mm -hmm. the kids were like, where are you? Mm -hmm. You know, and then um they would tap us and say, like, oh, what are you thinking right now? We noticed like that. To sort of bring in the conversation of what, what the kids are feeling. And but I, I really wonder, I see that the work is really focused on noticing what the teacher, teacher noticing. Mm -hmm. But do you see a potential or a way that you might fill in student voice at teacher respect or and student voice in the work? In, in, and at what point of the work? Because there's lots of places right. we could bring in student voice, right? Mm -hmm. um, I so, so with some of the teachers now who we're working with, they've been collecting um, like Google Forms. They do them every week where they try to get information about um, how 
they felt like teachers were attentive to them and in what ways. And so that's one thing that they're doing. Um, they're trying to get insight into um, from students, do the students feel like they've created a more affirming space for them? Um, they've also, one of the teachers that I, who I've been working with, he's been thinking a lot about disrupting the narrative of I'm not good at math. He said a lot of students enter his class saying, I'm not good at math. I've never been good at math. I'm not good at math. He's trying to disrupt that narrative. So he's asking questions that are at that, you know, to, to get feedback from him, from them, whether he thinks they are developing more confidence, whether they feel more comfortable, whether they feel like they are better at math. So we're bringing in student voice in that way. Um, I think what you also are getting at though, I think is something related to this sort of practice-based pedagogy of teacher preparation, along with teacher noticing and how we can bring these two into conversation with each other. Um, one of our methods instructors for the elementary methods class has been doing a lot of that work. Um, and, and Rosella Santagata has, has done some work in that way. Um, and I think Rosella's career grant, I think showed some really important findings that when the candidates were trained to use sort of her lesson analysis framework, um, which is sort of about paying more attention to student thinking than when they're in the classroom, it wasn't so much when they were student teaching, but when they started teaching their first, second years, um, they were, were more attentive to student thinking and they were really learning from students in a way that became more generative so that they could become more responsive. And again, I think this raises a lot of questions about how we study teacher learning. We have to really think about it over two, three, four year time scale. Um, so that's another way we've been attentive to students. In this case, I mean, there's, I think there's great affordances of looking at video, looking at transcripts, there's also weaknesses of that, right? But one of the things I, and the way I try to um, frame the class with my students is they sort of take a class on, um, we call it, um, I'm trying to think what the, it's like, I think it's called like uh, culture, language and equity now, I think is the broader framework. It's had different names over time. Um, so I call that like the, the like big view of, uh, you know, the, the 10, you're on the rooftop of an apartment building is the way I think about it. And I said, and in your methods classes, you're like in apartment 2B, for example, because that's where like all the stuff, you're learning how to like create a lesson plan, look at units, but it's like it, for teaching of math, or teaching of English or teaching of social studies, science and so on. I said, but in my class, you're like the, this is like the pot of chili that's on the stove. This is like where everything is happening. It's all gets mixed up in that big pot of chili. And you got to figure out like how all that stuff is getting mixed up together because all that stuff of the 10,000 foot view finds itself in that pot of chili. I don't, it's not the best analogy, but it came to me in class one day. And so I went with it. Um, my mom always liked to make chili. And so I think I had that analogy. Um, and so, you know, it's the messy stuff. It's like the messy kind of interactions and how can you be attentive in those messy interactions? And I think that one of the things we learned from the work with Miriam many, that she and I did many years ago was that as teachers became more attentive at that point to student thinking, they slowed down their instruction to the point that we could watch videos of them and see they weren't responding so quickly. They were just, there were, there were lots of pauses um, some of the teachers would go to the board and work out a math problem like the student did, erase it, and then come back to the group. They would say, you know, can you hold on a second? I need to go over here. I'll come back to you. They would go then talk to another group, and then they would come back. And it was indications that they were thinking about that student thinking, because then the, when they would come back, they would say, you know, this group over here, they were working on this thing. And now I'm looking at what you're doing. I think maybe you should talk to that group over there, but I think they need we inferred they needed time to think about this and they were using what they were learning here to make sense of what students were doing here. So that slowing down, I think is something that whether we train them through a practice-based pedagogy or attune them to needing to slow down, um, developing that sort of orientation and disposition to slow down in order to listen to 
and be responsive to students, I think is what I'm going for. Um, there's a beautiful paper by Vivian Paley called I, Thou, It, if any of you have not read it, but it's sort of the I is the teacher, the it is the, um, the learning of content, and the thou is when teachers and students and content all come together to be co-constructed. And she wrote this paper, it's like many years, 20, 30 years old. I think it's the same idea. Yeah, and we're trying to give some language to that. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Yeah, thank um, you. I'm really interested in, you broke down kind of personal history mm -hmm. and then systemic history, mm -hmm. power structure. Yeah. So I'm curious, like thinking with like Joyce King's framework of deciphering, I'm wondering how you see what kinds of resources you give students to preserve teachers to think about how teacher education in the United States itself mm -hmm. has been suffused with you know, racialized narratives mm -hmm. or even like the SPCA, there's mm -hmm. examples in the secondary science of asking students to think about Piagetian concrete operational thinking in relation to secondary students in a like students of color classroom. You can see like- Is that an FTPA? In one version. Oh my gosh. Previously. But there's, there's wow. ways in which the tools, the theories, the yeah. frameworks, Maslow, mm -hmm. like, you know, all of these other kind of hierarchies of ways mm -hmm. of classifying students are still embedded yeah. across our teacher education programs. So yeah, I'm a learning style. Right. Yeah, I mean, right. I, I'm always How do you support yeah. kind of the pre-service teachers to notice and attend mm -hmm. to not just personal biases or biases from society, but like within the mm -hmm. kind of teacher education yeah. tools and framework creation? Well, so there's a really great podcast that I came across this summer. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the podcast Educate, um, but it's an example of the Noble Schools Network in Chicago. Um, and it's a teacher who was, a uh, he's, he's now a journalist. He was a teacher there for many years. And he talks about how the Noble Schools had a framework and that shaped his notice. He doesn't call it his noticing, but that's what it is. So I tell everyone, let's listen to this. And then we analyze how that's about noticing and how, and then he goes back and he interviews students and he talks with them and they sort of say, oh yeah, that was like really uncool. And he sort of can understand that now. And so we're looking at how this framework that a school uh, used in order to give structure to a way of learning in this in this network was shaping a teacher's interactions and observations and how um, working with other teachers helped that teacher come to see that those were problematic and then how he aimed to disrupt that. So that podcast was really significant. Um, Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell has a couple things that I've used. Um, because he looks at education in particular. Uh, there was, I'm trying to think which, uh, which example this was. Was it about tracking? Um, oh, there was this really great example about uh, a policy that was, I'm trying to remember because we have so many different resources, but it was, it was playing out in Alabama, like as we were doing the PD, like in real time, and was like policy that had been created like 20, 30 years ago. So we were trying to think about how this was policy and then how it was, and I can't, I don't think it was related to tracking. I can't remember what the issue was. Um, assessment is often a place that becomes laden with a lot of these histories. So we look at assessment and think about how teachers think about assessment. And in, uh, some of our teachers have been really great at thinking about um, doing more standards-based assessment and how they think about that um, and sharing that with each other and that disrupts ideas. But then they talk about how their colleagues are don't understand how they can't you know, give scores to homework, right? Things like that. So we try to dig that up. Um, one, of a, one of the simple examples that comes out in the data is um, a pencil and what a pencil means in mathematics and whether a student has a pencil and how the teachers held on to the idea that they had to work with pencils. And then they realized the idea of having to work with a pencil, having to have pencils created so much conflict in the classroom. So then they sort of let go of that. And then the new teachers are like, how, how can you let go of that? And then they listen to why and how this teacher lets go of that. So one of the things we've done is built this noticing library. That's these clips of the teachers with their associated noticing interview. And now they're using that as a tool in professional development. Um, and we use that in the class and in other spaces. Yeah. 
I can switch next to that. Yeah, time. thank you. Um, so on behalf of the Philippians Committee, um, we just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, if you could give Dr. Van Ness a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know Graduate students, I think, are staying in this room for lunch. Um, and you'll have some more opportunities to talk with Dr. Dennis. Thank you all so much. And please sign in on your way out. We'll 